Good morning once again, dear church family. And it wasn't that, that long ago that we were asking the Lord to send us children. And now when the message begins, there's a little mass exodus <laughs> from the sanctuary. All the kids heading to Sunday school. I just want to thank Peter. Where are you at, Peter? Thank you, Peter, because the, what you sang about was the exact thing I was contemplating this morning. How good it is to be a part of the household of faith. If you were here last night, you, you heard my special lecture defending the rights of those who are most vulnerable among us, namely the unborn. And you know in our culture, if you're going to try to do that, you are, in, you are in the minority. You are trampling on a woman's right to destroy her offspring if she chooses. If you dare to stand up and give anything that sounds like a rational defense against that, you are on your own. And it was... <laughs> It's good to know there's still a few with like precious faith in the world. It's good to come here. This is like a little oasis <laughs> in a world that seems to be growing darker and darker, satanically dominated. It's good on a Sunday morning to be gathered with people of like precious faith, uh, co-citizens of New Jerusalem, coming soon. So it's good to be here. I'm very happy to be here with you all. We're going to be in the book of 1 Samuel as we continue our, continue our journey through the Bible together. We're going through the whole Bible. and uh, It's real easy to know what Pastor John's going to be preaching on next week. Just keep reading. <laughs> Just keep reading through your Bible. We're going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 14. And as you're locating 1 Samuel 14, let's just do a little review here. Remember that uh, God's special covenant people, Israel... They have requested a king. God has granted them their request. King Saul is the new king. And just like original man Adam, uh, Saul was a king with some authority. But both of these kings, though they started well and though they were given every conceivable advantage to do well, they both slipped into disobedience and sin and they began a downward spiral into total depravity. Now, I mentioned this last week, in Adam, in original man Adam, in him personally, you don't really see total depravity. I mean, it's there, but Adam, as far as we can tell, he never ended up as bad as a human being could be. There's still some sort of uh, grace there, I think, restraining the man. And that grace remains to this very hour in the world. And yet some people they really do become just about as bad as a human being can be. King Saul, we're going to find out as we traffic through the Bible, he almost gets there. A man who started off so uh, courageous, so godly-minded, so humble, so forgiving, so full of grace, could fall so far. It's an object lesson for all of us. Let's start well, let's finish well. Well, last week we saw that uh, King Saul's uh, son, Jonathan, he is a man who is, at this point, very godly-minded. In fact, he, is, he has such a faith commitment to God that God can do as he's promised, that God can save his people by few or by many, that Jonathan, with his armor-bearer, uh, attacked Israel's hated and feared enemies, the Philistines, and he won a tremendous uh, victory, and the enemies of Israel were scattered, they were defeated and scattered, and King Saul was so intoxicated by this victory that he made a very rash pronouncement. He put the children of Israel to a vow. He said, nobody here can eat anything or drink anything until I'm avenged. That's what, that's what King Saul said. We can see his mind now uh, changing its focus. Saul is no longer fixated on God, God's person, plans, and people. Saul is beginning to put his emphasis on himself. Nobody eats anything in Israel until I'm avenged, says Saul. And he makes the army swear that they won't eat anything. Well, of course, the army now is starving. They're hungry, weary. And, um, well, let's look what happened here. 14 and verse 27. You're going to find out that his son Jonathan, courageous Jonathan, didn't know about this rash pronouncement. Verse 27. But Jonathan had not heard his father charged the people with the oath, 
Therefore he stretched out the end of the rod that was in his hand and dipped it in a honeycomb. And he put his hand to his mouth and his countenance brightened. Then one of the people said, Your father strictly charged the people with an oath, saying, Cursed is the man who eats food this day. And the people were faint. But Jonathan said, My father has troubled the land. Look now how my countenance has brightened because I tasted a little of this honey. How much better if the people had eaten freely today of the spoil of their enemies which they found. For, how, for now would there have not been a much greater slaughter among the Philistines. So Jonathan had no idea of that rash pronouncement that his father had made. And uh, he actually, he says something very strong here. He says, my father has troubled the land. Now we've seen that, we've seen that phrase before. Do you remember where we've seen that? We saw that in the book of Joshua chapter 7, when the man Achan stole from Jericho. He took what he was not to take. God said, you leave all that stuff right there. You don't take any of that, that accursed, take any of those accursed things to yourself. And Achan stole, and because he stole, he brought sin into the camp, and Israel suffered a tremendous defeat at the Battle of Ai. And Joshua, when it was discovered who the villain was here, Joshua pronounced upon Achan, you are the troubler of Israel. And that man received the death penalty, remember? So uh, Jonathan is using rather strong language here. Uh, he knows what a serious charge this is, and he can see that his father is quickly slipping into depravity. And if we were to sort of synopsize the next few verses here, uh, we would see that the Philistines were defeated. Uh, they carried on attacking the Philistines, and the people were so starving, the army was so hungry, they just ran in and plundered the Philistines. They took their livestock, they killed them on the spot, and they ate the flesh with the blood still in it. And of course, that is absolutely contrary to the Mosaic law. Israel's still under the Mosaic law at this time. This is a serious offense now. They've broken the law of God. And we read that when King Saul heard this, he was absolutely enraged. He was troubled. You people are breaking God's law here. What are you doing? And so Saul commanded that uh, an new animals be taken and that they be, be prepared in accordance with the Mosaic law uh, so that God would not be offended and so on. And of course, he looks like some kind of a savior here. Saul has stepped in and he seems so very pious, but don't you understand? He's the problem. If he didn't uh, pronounce this rash oath on the people, they wouldn't have been starving and they would not have broken God's law. So Saul is quickly becoming blind. His sin is blinding the man. He is the problem, and he thinks he's some kind of a great savior here, a solution to the problem. He thinks he's the good guy. But I want to show you what sin will do to a person who's on the downward slide. Look at verse 36 now. Verse 36. Now Saul said, Let us go down after the Philistines by night and plunder them until the morning light. Saul kind of sounds like a poet there, doesn't he? Some of you are catching that. <laughs> okay, yeah. and, they, and he said, let us not leave a man of them. And they said, do whatever seems good to you. Then the priest said, let us draw near to God here. So Saul asked counsel of God, shall we go down after the Philistines? Will you deliver them into the hand of Israel? But he did not answer him that day. And Saul said, Come over here, all you chiefs of the people, and know and see what this sin was today. For as the Lord lives, who saves Israel, though it be in, my, in Jonathan my son, he shall surely die. But not a man among the people answered him. I want you to think about, very carefully now, think about what has happened here. Saul already had a plan in place, didn't he? He said, We're going to attack the Philistines. We're going to attack them until until morning. From night until morning, we'll attack these people. We will plunder them. We won't leave a man alive. He had the plan. And the priest said, maybe we should consult God. Let's draw near to God here. Let's ask God what he thinks of this plan of yours. So Saul reluctantly consults God. And we're not surprised that God doesn't answer him. Why doesn't God answer Saul? People want to know, why, why doesn't God answer my prayers? Well, here in this case, Saul, we remember from last week, 
he didn't want God's counsel earlier. Remember that? Saul told the priest, withdraw your hand, stop consulting God, it's a waste of time, I know what to do. He really didn't want God's advice earlier, he really doesn't want it now either. Do you remember? Here he is saying, well, I've already got a plan in place. It's the priest that has to step in and say, maybe we should ask the Lord. So Saul sort of reluctantly asks God, and God gives him no answer. And Saul is so blind now because of his sin, he thinks that somebody has committed a sin in Israel, and that's why God's not answering him. Isn't that amazing? The man doesn't even see his own depravity anymore. He says, well, we're going to get to the bottom of this. We're going to find out who has sinned in Israel and is preventing God from answering my inquiry. And uh, he is sure someone else is responsible. And in fact, he says, even if it's Jonathan, he will die, my own son. I mean, this guy is quickly uh, slipping into depravity here. And uh, well, you know what's happened here? Saul will separate the people. He will put Jonathan and himself on one side. The rest of Israel goes on the other side, and they cast lots. It's kind of like rolling dice, and that was a way to discern uh, the Word of God in those days. We don't do that today. We have a complete Bible. We do, you know, we consult God's Word now, but in those days, they would cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonathan. It looked like Jonathan was guilty, but now we have to be very careful here. God was not saying that Jonathan was guilty, really. God was simply answering King Saul. And we suspect Saul's inquiry looks something like this. Who among Israel has acted in incongruence with, with my command? Who has acted in a way contrary to what I have commanded? And the lot fell on Jonathan. Jonathan's the one that ate before the enemy was defeated. Now, this is not God saying Jonathan is guilty. It's just God answering the man's question. And the intention here, I'm sure, was to show Saul how rash he was, uh, how thoughtless his words really were. In fact, he's now putting his own son in danger. His, his own son's life is at, at stake here. See, this is God trying to show the man, hello, Saul, will you wake up, please? You are becoming far from me. You are going far from me. Where is the wisdom? Where is God-given wisdom? And look at verse 44. The man here is slipping quickly into darkness. Verse 44, Saul answered, God do so and more also, for you shall surely die, Jonathan. That's his own son he's talking to. Well, because he ate some honey. Really? I mean, I eat it by the barrel load. I mean... <laughs> That would be history. This man is completely deluded. His sin has completely deluded him. He is blind. He thinks he's behaving righteously. He thinks he's being tough-minded and holy and righteous. And Jesus talked to us about such people. In John 16, in verse 2, Jesus said, The time is coming that whoever kills you will think that he offers God a service. Sin blinds the hearts and minds of men. They really think that they have the moral high ground. If you were here yesterday, you would have seen some of that. There are hopelessly depraved people out there. We think they're almost reprobate at this point. And they recommend some, some of the most horrible things. And they really think that they're doing good. They've so deceived themselves that they're doing good. L look at Saul. He's a classic object lesson here. And you know what happened here? It's very interesting. Uh, King Saul really wants to pronounce the death sentence on his own son. And you know who comes to, to Jonathan's rescue? The people. The common people band together. They have God-given moral sensitivities, and they have God-given courage, and they will stand up to the king himself, and they will say, Jonathan will not die today. And, uh, you know, we think about King Jesus. We think about the Lord Jesus, and we think about the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the priestly class, engineering a judicial murder of the, of the Lord Jesus. And where was the people then? Where were they? Where were the people? They were chanting, crucify him, crucify him. We think, if only things would have been different, hey? But this is what sin will do. It will blind the hearts and minds of the people. 
Saul is, uh, well, he's a double-minded man. He will carry on attacking the enemies of Israel. He thinks they're his enemies personally, and he will continue attacking them. But his heart is not wholly set on God. He's now divided in his priorities, uh, his responsibilities. He is a double-minded man, and James warned us about double-minded people. And I'll show you how double-minded he really is. Look at chapter 15 and verse 1. Chapter 15 and verse 1. And this, is, this becomes a very serious sin in Israel. What's, what, uh, what Saul does or doesn't do, very serious offense. Chapter 15 and verse 1. Samuel also said to Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint you king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore heed the voice of the words of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I will punish Amalek for what he did to Israel, how he ambushed him on the way up uh, when he came up from Egypt. Now go and attack Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and do not spare them but kill both man and woman, infant and nursing child, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. Now, we've already talked about this when we examine the conquest narratives described for us there in the book of Joshua. Uh, maybe it doesn't lessen the impact of these verses. But let's put things, please, into perspective this morning. This is a, a specific and I'll admit it, horrific instruction, but it's given to a specific people group at a specific time in history, a specific geographical location concerning a specific group of people. This is not a command that is to be followed throughout all history and all time. God has not commanded his people to make actual physical war on those who reject the God of the Bible. He has never uh, issued such a command. This is a command given in a bygone dispensation. And friends, let's just please remember that God is the architect of life. He is the designer of human life. He is the creator, the upholder, the sustainer of life, and he will determine when life on earth is done. And God has his reasons for charging King Saul with this command as horrible as it may seem to us. We want to believe that every person that was destroyed there was either reprobate, they would never have accepted God's offer of salvation, ever, and in some sense, therefore, their execution was, a, was an act of mercy. They just would stop right now accruing sin debt, sin debt to themselves and heaping on punishment when they left the earth. The children we believe are provided for, they would receive the merits of what Jesus did on the cross or would do, and they would go to be with Jesus in heaven. We, we want to believe this. But either way, we are being reminded that God has an absolute zero tolerance for sin and disobedience, and he said, we're going to wipe out Amalek. The Amalekites are to be totally destroyed. Well, look what happened here in verse uh, 9, 15 and verse 9. But Saul and the people, now note that, Saul and the people spared Agag, that's the king of the Amalekites, and the best of the sheep, the oxen, the fatlings, the lambs, and all that was good, and were unwilling to utterly destroy them. But everything despised and worthless, that they utterly destroyed. Now the word of the Lord came to Samuel, saying, I greatly regret that I have set up Saul as king, for he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel, and he cried out to the Lord all night. Look at what's happened here. S uh, king Saul and the people decided they would keep the good stuff for themselves. All that we think is worth, worth something among the Amalekites, we'll keep that. And all the worthless trash, we'll destroy all that. Uh, and so they are obeying God incompletely. They are, in a sense, just being greedy and plundering these people and taking what they want. And so this partial obedience here will destroy the worthless stuff. And I want you to see this. It's very, very uh, telling and it's very powerful that God feels regret. 
ultimate reality, friends, is not some impersonal force. It's a personal God, and God feels things. God gets angry. Sometimes God rejoices. Sometimes God feels regret. Here, God feels deep regret that he set up Saul, king of Israel. And it isn't that God is acknowledging that he's made some kind of mistake. You remember that God felt regret uh, during the pre-flood years. It, God says he regretted that he put man on the earth. It, the, the world became so wicked, so dark, depraved, violent, that only the waters of a global deluge could cleanse the planet. God felt regret. God was not happy with the depravity he was seeing, the wickedness, the violence that he saw on the earth. He feels the same now concerning King Saul. God felt regret. And look at Samuel. It says that Samuel cried out to God all night. All night it grieved Samuel, God's people. I'd like to ask a question. How often are we praying for our leaders? How often do we do that? And how, how much heart involvement is actually there? I want to remind us that God and his people feel for the lost. We feel for their wrong choices that they make and the harmful consequences of those choices. There ought to be some genuine heart involvement in some of this. I don't think I've ever cried out all night long to God for my government that's over me right now. Maybe I should. Samuel did that. This is, has nothing to do with cold, sterile, religious orthodoxy or ritual. It has everything to do with genuine heart involvement in what's going on in the world. Well, we're going to have a confrontation here. Saul, uh, Saul has been disobedient, and God's man Samuel is about to confront that disobedient king. Take a look now at verse 13. Samuel is going to confront the king. Verse 13. Then Samuel went to Saul... And Saul said to him, Blessed are you of the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. Really. But Samuel said, What then is this bleeding of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? And Saul said, They have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God, and the rest we have utterly destroyed. Look at this confrontation. So Samuel comes to Saul, and King Saul is very cheerful. He has a big smile on his face. Mission accomplished, Samuel. We have did what the Lord commanded us to do. We've done it all. And Samuel says, well, what's this bleeding of the sheep I hear? You, you remember the proverb? A gentle answer turns away wrath. He didn't confront Saul head on in, you know, in a hateful uh, direct fashion, he had a soft answer for the king. In other words, if you really did what you said you, were, you, did, you have done, if you really were obedient 100% to the Lord, I shouldn't be hearing these animals here. I thought you're supposed to wipe them all out, remember? <laughs> What's this bleeding of the sheep I hear? And by the way, that's a gentle reminder to us too, by the way. Uh, I learned a long time ago from uh, the old Walter Martin. Anybody hear of Walter Martin before? One of my heroes in the faith. Uh, he was, I think, second to none when it came to confronting false, errant, even satanic religious systems in competition with Christianity. He could confront these people in rational dialogue, interchange, even rational combat, and when he had them pinned to the mat intellectually, he had enough grace to let them go. Let them off the hook. You don't have to keep beating people. That's, that's what we ought to be doing. Okay? If you made your point... Just let the point hang there and don't keep beating on people intellectually. You can be kind to people too, even people you disagree with, right? You can do like, kind of like Samuel. You know, Saul says, I've accomplished the mission. Well, what's this bleeding of the... I'm hearing animals here. <laughs> Tell me what's been happening. Tell me really what's going on, you see? And, um, well, King Saul, of course, just comes out and lies. King Saul lied. He shifted the blame. Uh... He said that the people, they have brought them from the Amalekites, the people spared the best uh, of the sheep and the oxen. And yet we read earlier on, Saul and the people were responsible for this. He, Saul had shifted the blame. Uh, and he says, well, we're keeping the animals for sacrifice. Oh, are you? Yes. And he says, sacrifice to your God. 
Samuel. Oh, he's not your God anymore, Saul? It's coming out now in his speech, isn't it? Sure. I've heard this before, too. I get into a rational interchange with someone who claims to be a brother, and they start assassinating the church. And the next thing you know, they're talking like there's somebody outside the church. This is why we think this of you guys. Oh, now it's coming out who you really are. See? Now we're getting to see what's in Saul's heart for real. Well, look at this. I mean, this is, this is really interesting, and this is very powerful and very um, essential, I think. Saul said, we kept those animals to make a sacrifice to your God. And, and Samuel now has something to say about that. Look at verse 22. Verse 22. So Samuel said... Has the, Lord as, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he also has rejected you from being king." Friends, right here, we are being reminded of the value and significance of obedience. Why is obedience to God so valuable? Why is it so significant? It's valuable and significant because our obedience reflects our love we have for God. And that is the greatest commandment of all. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Jesus said so. That is the greatest commandment. Jesus said in John 14, 21, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. He that keeps my commandments, he it is that loveth me. And I will love him and manifest myself to him. Jesus said that. That's why obeying is so significant. It's a genuine expression of your love for God. Well, Saul here, he's becoming so dull intellectually and spiritually, which is what sin does to somebody. This lover of self really thinks he can placate the God of Israel by engaging in mechanical ritualism. I'll just offer a few animals to that God. He'll be happy with that. That is paganism. That is pagan religious philosophy. Trust me, I know. That is Vedic Hinduism, right? That is uh, pre-Hinduistic pre uh, uh, Vedism. You just offer these gods what they're asking for, and this business-like relationship continues, and they're happy, and they'll give you what you want. That is not the relationship we have with the God of Israel. No way. We love him, John said, because he first loved us. There is love-trust relationship happening here, or supposed to be happening here. We will not placate the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob with sterile mechanical ritualism. We just say the right things, and we offer the right sacrifices, and then we do whatever we want through the week. That is not going to make God happy. God says he wants you to love him. And he's already made himself maximally lovable in coming into the world in the person of his son, Jesus, and dying on a cross and hanging there for six hours and receiving in his body the penalty for our sins. Greater, greater love hath no man than this, that he will lay his life down for his friends, Jesus said. And yet, at the fullness of time, Jesus came into the world and died for his enemies. How do you like that one? That's love. That is a genuine expression of the greatest love imaginable and we are to love him in return. Saul is so depraved, he doesn't see any of this anymore. He just sees himself and how he might placate the God of Israel with his mechanical ritualism. We are told in these precious uh, verses that we just read, rebellion is the same as witchcraft, and stubbornness is like idolatry. It's the same thing. One sin is as bad as another. All sin separates us from God. In fact, James 2.10 reminds us that whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble on one point, he is guilty of all. And that's God's powerful reminder to all of us that there are no such things as venial sins. There are no venial sins. Every sin leads to death. All Adam, did, he, all Adam and Eve did was pick a fruit off a tree and take a bite. And the whole, because they did that, the whole created order fell into wreck, ruin, and chaos. The whole thing was cursed. And some so-called Christian denominations, eating a piece of fruit would have been a venial sin. That's just a venial sin. Say a couple prayers. There, you're absolved. Right? 
No, I mean, that, that's not Christian theology. All sin separates us from God. All sin is a stench in the nostrils of God. In Amos 1.13, we are reminded that God is of purer eyes than to look upon evil, and friends, as his children, we should be too. King David said in the Psalms, I will not let my eyes fall on any wicked thing. I will not set my eyes on anything wicked. I wonder how we're doing with that. How we're doing with our, our eyes set, being set on wicked things? What are the things that, what things entertain us? How do we spend our time? What do we have time for? God is of pure eyes to look on evil, and we should be too. In fact, the Apostle Peter reminds us, God is holy, and we are to be his holy people. How are we doing? I mean, these, these, this is convicting, isn't it? It's very convicting to me too. But I want to leave us on a positive note here, okay? I don't want to bludgeon us all, and then we all leave depressed here today. The Apostle Paul reminds us that where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. There is cleansing and forgiveness for sin. If we will confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. But let's not make any mistake, friends. Though Christ can forgive your sins here while you're still in the land of the living, there may be serious consequences here for the sins that, that we commit. In our sin, we may forfeit certain privileges, responsibilities that we otherwise may have received. We can blow our witness by living in an immoral lifestyle. We can kill our witness to the world. The salt can't be made salty again, Jesus said. These are powerful reminders to us. King Saul, well, there's a real difference between him and King David. I'd like to recommend something to us here today. It's a little thing called repentance. Change your mind. Turn to Christ. King Saul messed up in spades. You know what he never did? He never really repented. And as far as we know, that man slipped into a Christless eternity. I mean, he slipped into hopeless, reprobate depravity. King David slipped into sin, too. We're going to see it. King David slipped into serious sin. King David had a bad year of sinning, lying. You know what he did? He repented. He wrote some psalms about it. Blessed is the man whose sins are forgiven, to whom God shall not impute iniquity. David understood the blessedness of forgiveness and cleansing from sin. I think most of us here know the blessedness of uh, the person who's repented and received cleansing and forgiveness. But friends, we've got to keep short account of sin. We've got to keep short account of it. We've got to repent daily. <laughs> The Lord Jesus taught us how to pray, didn't he? Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. I think oftentimes we pray and we forget to ask God for cleansing and forgiveness. I think the more we do that, the greater our chance of not slipping off a center. The greater our chance of starting well and finishing well. Just a little reminder to all of us. Well, friends, these are powerful things in the Bible and Maybe I'll just end with a, a final thought from the book of Philippians. Philippians contains a wonderful promise there in the first chapter. The promise is this, that those who have entered into a love-trust relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ are people in whom God Almighty has begun a good work. And Paul says in the sixth verse of that beautiful chapter, Philippians 1, he who has begun a good work in you will perform it. So don't get depressed or discouraged today, friends. God has started a good work in you. He won't, he won't stop working in you. He won't drop you halfway. He'll take you all the way to the, the shores of that beautiful new heavens and earth that he's preparing. It's a good message. All right, friends, how about a word of prayer? And then uh, we'll worship the Lord one more time. Are we going to do that, Nathan? Okay, let's honor the Lord with our prayers here. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' mighty, beautiful name, uh, Lord, we're still a little bit reeling here from what we've read this morning. Powerful things. Uh, Lord, thank you for reminding us that you're a holy God. With you, the wicked cannot dwell. Thank you for reminding us that you're of a 
purer eyes than to look upon evil. Thank you, Lord, for reminding us of the holiness of the high call that you have uh, you've called us to. Uh, Lord, we, we know that we are still weak in our own strength. We, in fact, we have none, and we have nothing to commend ourselves to you. But we thank you, Lord, that while we were without strength, Jesus Christ has come into the world to pay our sin debt in full, to regenerate us and make us something new and beautiful in the eyes of our holy God. Thank you, Lord, that the saving benefits of what Jesus did on the cross are accessible through faith alone. Thank you that it's a free gift to be accepted and received. Thank you for the promise that uh, you are not done with us. You are still conforming us to the image of Jesus Christ, God's beloved one. Thank you that you will perform that work. You will complete that work. Thank you for the promise of the kingdom of Christ coming soon to the earth where Jesus will take his stand and subdue all things to himself. Thank you that we get to be a part of that beautiful, godly, holy administration that you one day will launch into the world. We love you, God. We thank you for the privilege of gathering with the saints and opening your holy book, the Bible. Thank you. Receive our worship now one last time this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. God bless you all.